Welcome to Shalom World's G2G. I'm Pete Burak. Today's episode features a man of deep faith and the former judge of the Supreme Court of India, Honorable Justice Kurian Joseph. If someone is to take a vote on who is the nicest judge, Kurian Joseph will win, said the Attorney General of India at the formal farewell ceremony in the Supreme Court of India. Justice Kurian Joseph was born into a Roman Catholic family hailing from Kerala, a southern state in India. He began his practice as an advocate at the Kerala High Court in 1979. At the age of 42, he was the youngest to be designated as a senior advocate. In the year 2000, he was appointed as a judge of the High Court of Kerala. And in 2010, he was appointed as Chief Justice of the High Court of Himachal Pradesh. In 2013, he was elevated to the Supreme Court of India. Though Kurian Joseph was the nicest judge out there, during his five-year, eight-month tenure as an apex court judge, he stood out for his strong stands for justice, equality, dignity, right to freely profess, practice, and propagate religion, rule of law, independence of the judiciary, and the like. From delivering impactful verdicts and standing up for the least, the last, and the lost, if I look back, except on days where I was either on sick bed or I was on travel, I have never missed the Holy Eucharist. I have participated and have received the Holy Communion also daily. Kurian Joseph has constantly been in the limelight. He also holds the accolade of being one of the ten judges in the history of the Supreme Court of India who authored more than 1,000 judgments. While Cody and Joseph might brush them aside as being part of the job, his verdicts have had monumental impacts on the lives of many in India. When the bench gathered for a case concerning the triple talaq, a practice which gives a Muslim husband the right to divorce his wife by uttering talaq three times in one sitting without his wife's consent, Cody and Joseph, in the constitutional bench, declared the practice unconstitutional. The Nagaraj case, also known as the Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribe Judgment, was another historical verdict through which minority groups in India were able to claim their rights. Kurian Joseph has never delivered a death sentence in his 18-year career as a judge. Kurian Joseph held the roster on matrimonial cases in the Supreme Court for a long time and is known to make best efforts to reunite couples and families. In 2018, Justice Joseph affixed to his judgment a handmade thank you card penned by a 10-year-old boy, expressing his gratitude to the court for settling a slew of disputes between his parents. The amendment to allow women to abort unwanted pregnancies up to 24 weeks has been pending since 2014. So women are supposed to approach the Supreme Court in exceptional circumstances. When one such case was before a bench headed by Justice Joseph, he gave away what he thought of abortion in a single word, murder. His diverse and complex verdicts show that he could not be bracketed either as liberal or as conservative. One thing is for sure, he drew parallels from the Bible and the Constitution in molding constitutional morality. The Constitution on which I am uh, called to uphold and uh, interpret the laws in terms of the Constitution, those constitutional values are actually the values that I found in the Gospel as well. Justice Kurian Joseph. Justice Kurian, welcome to G2G. How are you today? I'm good. How about you? All good? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Thank you for being on the show. We're, we're honored and humbled by your presence. I want to start here. First question. You had a very long and illustrious 
uh, career in law. What inspired you to take that path? Anything from your past, your family? What what prompted you to pursue this career? I'm a first generation lawyer in my family. Of course, my father had uh, some connection with the court, the high court of uh, Kerala, where he was on the ministerial service. He served a cler- as a clerk there till he retired in the year 1972. I joined law in 1976. Uh, for me, when I look back, I find that you know, I've been very active in all the PICE organizations uh, right from my early childhood, starting at the age of seven as an altar boy, then went to the um, childhood ministries, then to the uh, Marian Sodality at that time, which is now C, uh, the Christian Life Community, then to uh, Little for Mission League, then to ICAF. In all these areas, I was in the leadership. So I had a flair for public speaking also. While I was a student, I was deep into student politics. I was a good debater. So all these things, when I thought, you know, there's, the right choice would be to 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 be to become a lawyer so that I can stand up and speak out. Because in all these organizations, I've been uh, speaking out and standing up the cause of others. So that way, I thought that was the best uh, career for me. You received the Eucharist daily. How did you feel like that supported you in your both in your career? in your ability to make right judgment, and in your courage in able to speaking out, as you just mentioned. If I look back, except on days where I was either on sick bed or I was on travel, I have never missed uh, the Holy Eucharist. I have participated and have received the Holy Communion also daily. If I were not able to on account of any sinful disposition, well, I had the opportunity to have a, a confession and then I have received the Holy Communion also. That has been a great pillar of strength to me because Jesus has told us it is life that is given to me. So if, he, if his life comes to me, well, that is my great life. I get life and life that is in abundance. And of course, uh, my daily uh, devotion to Mother Mary through the Rosary. So these were these two were the real pillars on my left and right. If I look back, which uh, gave me a real strength to uh, to be on the right path. As a disciple of Jesus, was there ever a, a tense moment when the law of man conflicted with the law of God, and your conscience was maybe torn between? The, the duty that you have to the Constitution, but was there ever a time when the Constitution or the laws were in conflict with what you believed God's eternal law is and demands? Fortunately for me, I never had any such occasion. The reason is, we have a Constitution of India which says, which has uh, secured to all citizens justice, social, economic, and political. Liberty of uh, thought, expression, faith, belief, and worship. Equality of status and opportunity. Fraternity, assuring the dignity of individual. For me, these are the gospel values. I never have ever had any problem because the constitution on which I am uh, called to uphold and uh, interpret the laws in terms of the constitution, those constitutional values are actually the values that I found in the gospel as well. Justice, you had thousands of rulings over the course of your illustrious career. Can you think of any or one in particular that really personally impacted you, that really touched your heart in the way uh, that justice was served and the response from the people who you were serving in that moment? A class four. Class four means the lowest rank uh, in India. A person came uh, for uh, in respect of a service grievance. And she could not speak, um, because in the language that we follow in India in court is English. She could not speak a single word in English. But I found a young girl accompanying her. She had uh, at least done a bit of uh, her education. She was, I saw she is uh, just weeping, uh, you know. Uh, so I asked her, who are you? She told me something that, you know, I just accompanied this person. She had this problem. But nobody is realizing that problem. 
So she asked my permission to speak. I have given that permission. She literally cried in court because of the joy that she got when she could speak. Normally, only the, the client speaks or the lawyer speaks, but she could speak in court. So after that, I asked her whether you want to become a lawyer. She said, uh, see, I have so many dreams in my life, uh, but nobody has ever helped me to attain those dreams. I always, because I am doing a lot of social service, if I become a lawyer, I will be able to do great social service. Her name is Rita. So I told them, you are going to become a student of law tomorrow onwards. She told me, sir, many people have told me like this, but nobody has helped me. I said, this is not this, this I'm telling you, don't worry. So I put, put the story, cut the story short. Uh, three years she studied, she became a lawyer, and she is a wonderful social worker and activist lawyer in Himachal Pradesh. Now, that's another touching moment in my life I experienced. When you retired, you you came out in favor of abolishing the death penalty. Is some of what you just said partially the reason for this, or what other factors weighed into your willingness to publicly stand and say that this this current system within the, the government and the legal sphere should no longer exist moving forward? Many countries uh, across the world have uh, abolished uh, uh, death penalty because um, who takes the life? It's the state who takes the life, uh, you know, in, in imposing death penalty. State who is uh, bound to protect the life becomes the portrait of life <laughs> in that way. Uh, in imposing death penalty. So I always had uh, a very serious concern about uh, the validity of uh, death penalty and retaining death penalty as a punishment uh, in the book of law. Uh, towards the, uh, in my career as a judge in the Supreme Court, uh, we have a constitution bench uh, judgment upholding the uh, validity of that death penalty. That is why constitution bench means a judge of five judges. So sitting in the lower court of three, I made an observation that it is high time that uh, uh, the said decision is reconsidered. Reason is uh, the same because uh, it's an irreversible punishment, number one. Number two, who wanted to judge that uh, this person has uh, committed uh, this murder uh, with the right full intention and, uh, you know, which actually caters to, which actually... Uh, you know, uh, deserves the, the, the maximum punishment uh, where, you know, he cannot be uh, rehabilitated, he cannot be reformed. These are some of the uh, purposes of punishment also. So therefore, uh, you cannot say that uh, one will not change tomorrow. Because it's, it's human mind. Today you can be a sinner, tomorrow you can be a saint. As we often say, you know, every... Uh, Saint has a past and every sinner has a future. And that is what the theory that the law also recognizes. It's not a sublime teaching by Jesus or by the church, but it's actually the, 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 the principle recognized by law also. Every uh, sinner or every wrongdoer or, or every person who breaks law, you know, if properly uh, uh, what they call guided, he has a future. He can be rehabilitated. That, that's why Rehabilitation is one of the purposes of uh, uh, punishment. Reformation is, a punish is one of the purposes of punishment. So you can reform a person and then rehabilitate him and get him back to the mainstream of the society. By committing a crime, he goes away from society because he has done it against the state, against the society. Therefore, uh, the state has a duty to see whether this person can be reformed and rehabilitated and brought back to the mainstream of the society to, to, to make him part of the same society, realizing that uh, he has um, made amends uh, for uh, the, the offense he has committed, the crime he has committed, the wrong he has done to the society. Switching gears slightly, let's talk about marriage. So you had the, the great joy, I'm sure, to have three marriages in your family and celebrate them in the in what I've been told was a, a great deal of generosity in terms of giving away food and taking care of some of the homeless during those days of celebration, and a great de deal of simplicity when in a country where marriages are often can be a more of a business transaction or a variety of different motivations behind it. Clearly, you've approached it differently in your family. Can you speak to uh, what inspired you to take this approach? Was it your Christian faith? Was it uh, 
do you just love your children more or what? What, what's, what was the inspiration for how you approached marriage in your family? I will tell you something about my own marriage first. Thereafter, I'll just speak about my children. My marriage, uh, I selected my life partner. Of course, uh, my parents uh, could not uh, digest it uh, origin, I mean, at the early instance, but thereafter they realized that I have made the right choice and uh, we have been the, the dearest ones uh, for, uh, for my parents. And uh, that was uh, a marriage where, you know, uh, where I just went in the common man's dress uh, and uh, we never had a, a great public reception. After the marriage, uh, we had a uh, rather a public gathering. All of us were there. I had a piece of cake uh, and a cup of tea. The same thing I gave to everybody else also. So when it came to my uh, children's uh, marriage, I have three, two daughters and a middle son. On the uh, marriage of my first daughter, uh, you know, we had uh, certain prayer groups and all my friends. So we all gathered together and uh, prayed as to how to celebrate uh, uh, this marriage. So uh, some of us uh, during prayer, we got a message that, you know, you may invite people because uh, you, at that time I was a judge in the high court. A lot of connections also. That is my first marriage in my family also. So you have to uh, have a sort of gathering. This is, is not against this sort of uh, people coming to the and celebrating because life is, is celebration also. Do that. But uh, the number of people that you're feeding, double the number you feed elsewhere. So we selected all the orphanages around and then, you know, made arrangements for food. The second uh, a message I got, uh, you know, which evolved during our prayer was that, you know, uh, please invite those people who are on the streets, uh, who have uh, uh, nowhere to look after, wish nobody in life, and were beggars and street uh, people li uh, living on the street also. So we got an invitation card for them also. We uh, made arrangements to invite them also personally. And all of them came, we had a, uh, reception for them also. And after marriage, uh, um, this reception went on and we went, all of us, the um, bride and bridegroom along with uh, my in-laws and uh, me, of course, all of us, the members of the family, we had um, um, to prayer service with them also and the food also with them. We got uh, certain orchestra also for them. And we gave the gifts also. It was a wonderful um, occasion. We did the same thing for the second marriage also. And third, of course, at all the three occasions, uh, we had these sorts of celebrations. And uh, plus, um, if you don't take it otherwise, I also chose to get one family, one girl in a poor family, get married in all the three marriages. So, so that also was uh, something which I could do. So the little that you can do, you must not refrain from doing it. Please don't take it as if I am, uh, you know, <laughs> speaking something about myself. But uh, since you asked me this personal question, since um, Holy Spirit also told me this is time you can speak out because this is uh, something which you have witnessed, which you have done in your life. Please speak out. I, I spoke out. I was told once you you amicably settled a marriage case and the, the son of the couple was a 10-year-old boy who wrote you a postcard uh, I, I guess, in gratitude with these words on it. And I, I'd like you to reflect on it, if you would. He, he said that God always has something for you, a key for every problem, a light for every shadow, a relief for every sorrow, and a plan for every tomorrow. You know, we're not naive enough to think that every marriage and every family is uh, seemingly as peaceful and joyful as yours. In, in cases that you've had to settle either broken marriages or women persecuted for dowry or you know, old parents abandoned by their children. What, what, what does this little boy's note mean to you in in the context of when families and and relationships don't work out or are not um, blessed by kind of a Christian understanding and Christian love and charity in the midst of them? All through my career, uh, spanning over to eighteen years and uh, four months as a judge in the high court and. Uh, ending up in Supreme Court uh, for uh, around six years. Uh, I always had uh, this approach, you know, getting the families that was uh, driven apart on account of maybe lack of understanding, maybe on account of misunderstanding, 
maybe on account of wrong understanding so if you get them around and talk to them you will be in a position to know whether they have uh, the right discernment as to their um, uh, uh, marriage and of their um, family and about their uh, duty to bring up the children etc the one occasion that you mentioned about i simply remember that boy i think his name was bibu uh, 10 years old yes uh, he is the only child of the family a very educated family very affluent family also but uh, he was torn apart they were involved in about 14 or 15 cases in various courts uh, warring parents uh, and you know regarding their relationship regarding the custody of the child etc in all such cases you know bit what happens is you know you may fight each uh, against each other but you know there is somebody who is suffering in between that is the casualties you are telling whom do they stand with stand up with whom they stand so they, they cannot uh, you know in the process you know they they become the the, the fugitives i see you know they take all tricks to please their mother when the mother they are with the mother they please uh, take all steps you know to please their father and the father is there you know so they you 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 really spoil their lives so i made them realize all these aspects um, and uh, the the child the baby was very happy that i could resolve the issue and he sent me a card and i made it a part of the judgment also maybe the first time in the history the supreme court of india i made that card which the child gave us a postcard uh, as a thanks giving card made it a part of the judgment uh, my approach always has been you know we believe in this in what god has united let man not put us at you you cannot uh, uh, drive them apart uh, you cannot disunite them if god has made thank you for your extraordinary courage thank you for your faithfulness to the lord and to your family and uh, thank you for being on g2g and being willing to share what jesus has done in you and through you and uh, we're just delighted that you joined us so justice kurian thank you very much for being on g2g god bless you thank you for this wonderful opportunity I'm so inspired by Justice Kurian's ability and desire to live a full life of faith while also pursuing justice in a in a career in law. And people have a high expectation of the judiciary to be able to fulfill the common man's aspirations for life. And Justice Kurian pursued the law of God fully and pursued the law of man fully and brought them together in a beautiful witness of a life well lived, pursuing Jesus and pursuing the path that he put before him. So thank you Justice Kurian. Thank you for watching Shalom World's G2G. I'm Pete Burak and we'll see you next time. Problems, worries, sadness. Are you seeking solutions? Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Choose faith over fear.